welcome. Uh, very happy to moderate this panel. And particularly because in the last few years, we have been talking about the censorship of the media. And there have been a lot of comparisons made with the emergency. In fact, many of us have often spoken to each, each other and said that, wish it was a declared emergency, because it is not. But the rules are, in a way, similar, or at least that's what we think of. This is also a time when uh, earlier things were done by the government. There was a direct imposition. But now the same role, what the state did, has been taken over by the market. So there is a corporate political nexus at work. There is, uh, uh, for instance, even if you want to do some stories, you cannot uh, do a story on prime time on malnutrition because you have to sell the pressure cooker in that same slot. So you're messing up with the buying mood of the uh, viewers. Uh, we also know of a fantastic newspaper that we all read. But we know that there are standing instructions that you cannot criticize number one and number two on the front page. So uh, there is a lot of self-censorship inside. We also know of newspapers who actually cater their news for somebody called Neha Chadda in Lajpat Nagar, because Neha Chadda in Lajpat Nagar is only interested in bags and technology, so which is why the market is playing that role. So there are various factors at work right now. Uh, and apart from uh, the government directly intervening or uh, using not just press freedom sort of uh, uh, complications, but actually imposing law and order related situations in front of the journalists, actually charging them with that, is also becoming a problem. So I, it is fantastic that we both have, we have uh, Kalpana and we have Chandar to talk about what are the parallels and what are the similarities, and if there are any similarities or the times are different uh, uh, from the 70s. So I'll start with you, Kalpana. Uh, do you, let me start with this. That do you actually think that there, there is any similarity between what happened in the 70s in terms of censorship and what is happening now? Uh, yes and no. <laughs> um, no, because I think it's important to understand that both the economy and the media are two completely different creatures from what they were in the 70s, right? And in the 70s, there was print, all India radio, controlled by government, and Doordarshan had just started, um, and very limited service. Uh, today, you know, you have this plethora of ways in which people get information, and um, it's not even, you can't even call it media anymore, because there is so much that we would not even classify as media, uh, which are the sources of information. In the 70s and really up to the uh, late 80s, early 90s, I would say print was literally king. I mean, when, as a reporter, when I would go anywhere, people would say, ha, humne akbar mein pada. you know, that was like enough confirmation that this must be the truth because it has appeared in print. Today, it's not so. It's like humne WhatsApp pe dekha, which means half of it may be wrong. That is one thing. The second thing I think to realize is politics and the economy are very different. So in the 70s, we didn't have the consumer economy that we have today. So even though, of course, there were pressures on the privately owned newspapers of a different kind, not of the market that we see today, which began in the 90s with liberalization. So I think those are two very important things where we, we should just place those before we even start thinking about comparisons. And the third most important thing, I think, of that emergency period of 20 months was that it was a declared emergency there were rules that were set out. It was uh, according to what the law permitted, apparently. And so those of us, especially who were journalists, we knew what the parameters were. The trouble today is, in the so-called undeclared emergency, is you don't know because it's arbitrary. I mean, today it can be one thing, tomorrow it will be something else. Two years ago, Siddiq Kapan goes as a journalist to cover Hathras, and he's arrested, you know. So we don't know today. So, I mean, even though there was arbitrariness, even in those 20 months in the way censorship functioned, it was there, you know, you could see it. We had those guidelines that were sent to all of us. Today, there are no guidelines, and I think that way it's much more dangerous. At that time, we were conscious that the state was all powerful and could do whatever. At this time, there is a delusion that we are still a democracy and that there are these rights, but in fact, the state has become much more powerful in the way it's going around. So I think, I mean, I'll just say that I'll talk about later the whole process, but I think these are the 
factors we must keep in mind when we do these comparisons between the 70s and today. And what about you? Do you see any similarities or differences between the 70s and now? Um, well, I, I, I join Kalpana in, uh, in saying that, uh, you know, the in the emergency uh, of uh, 1975 to 1977, it was a declared emergency and it, uh, it went under a veneer of the rule of law in the sense that um, there were actual orders issued under the Defense of India Act 1968, under uh, so-and-so, under the press uh, um, objectionable material act or whatever, uh, orders and so on. So you had things like you had pre-censorship, but there was a central censorship order issued under Section 48 of the Def Defense of India uh, Act 1968. De Defense of India Rules 1971, sorry. So there was a framework, and that framework could be challenged. And it was, in fact, challenged. Um, uh, for instance, uh, Minu Masani, um, um, what was his uh, paper? Freedom First. Freedom First. Minu Masani challenged it in the Bombay High Court, though the judgment in his favor ultimately came in 1986, which was uh, a fair way into the uh, emergency, more than a year uh, uh, had passed out of those 20 odd months. Uh, but the Bombay High Court, um, upheld his right to publish and to not submit to self uh, to pre censorship. The Gujarat High Court, similarly, in the case of Chunibai Mehta, Ch Chunilal Mehta, Chunibai Mehta, um, uh, the Gujarat High Court also uh, Chunibai Vedya, sorry, yeah. uh, Chunibai Vedya, the Gujarat High Court also held. Uh, um, he was a Gandhian and he had a paper called Bhumi Putra, and the Gujarat High Court, uh, similar to the Bombay High Court. Uh, held that he had a right not to submit to pre-censorship. So there was a, there were laws, they were capable of challenge in, um, uh, in certain cases. Now, none of the mainstream papers uh, could challenge them because the mainstream papers had this, some problems which are similar to, to today, that you were completely dependent on the government. They, they needed newsprint. Newsprint was 100% canalized. It was only the state trading corporation could import newsprint into, into India. So they needed government advertising, which only the DAVP uh, would give. There was nobody else who could give you government. Uh, there, was, there was hardly any state advertising in those days. So it was central government was the big, uh, you know, the big player in everything. So none of them dared to challenge it, even though the challenges were legally, technically available, uh, you know, subject to the ADM Jabalpur kind of thing. But it was there. Today, as uh, uh, Kalpana rightly says, uh, that you have, you have all the laws in place, you have all the freedoms in place, and you have a way of subverting them, which is co-opting all the various organs of the state. So now um, it's, a, it's a situation where we have the heckler's veto. Uh, what used to be known as the heckler's veto has now been elevated to a state of, uh, a, you know, to a sort of a fine art where somebody in Gauhati or somebody in uh, you know uh, a, a remote uh, little uh, town somewhere east west north south whatever will file a complaint the state administration and might be at a very low level might be a thanedar's level or might be a dysp or somebody will lodge with uh, lodge an fir on that and they'll keep those dormant till they need to to you know weaponize them so laws are now weaponized at the behest of many different players. So it could be the state directly, it could be uh, proxies of the state, it could be just, uh, you know, a religious, uh, um, you know, seer or somebody like that. So you have a situation now where the laws are being weaponized against the media instead of the laws being uh, activated by the media. So, so there, there, are, there are a lot of differences. And, and of course, a lot of the differences, which some of the positive differences will also stem from what Kalpana said that the uh, the whole landscape has changed so much that uh, total, totally muzzling the people, as could be done earlier, perhaps can't be done today. But, uh, but to spread the atmosphere of fear can be done on a much larger scale uh, uh, today than it was then. Thank you for that. But uh, uh, like you said rightly, and Raya Kalpana, you were also talking about it, that Earlier, of course, and even I was just reading your article about uh, Himmat in the morning, and I just told you about it. And you had experiences of going to the special press advisor and then telling you what is dangerous and what is it that can't be published. At 
cut to what is happening now where there is like chomsky rightly puts puts it out and says that there's a private ministry of information and culture which is controlled not just by the state but also market players but uh, could you tell us what were your experiences with going and meeting the special press advisor and getting things approved or uh, held back how was it like so you know we were uh, himmat was a very small weekly magazine and the editor in chief was rajmohan gandhi so on the 26th when we realized that there was press censorship uh we had a discussion we were very small staff about whether we should suspend publication you know this is what gandhi ji would have done others would have done rather than submit to censorship so should we just close it down and actually it was many of us full hardy younger ones i was only 3 years into journalism at that time who insisted that we just had to figure out a way of surviving and um, rajmohan uh, you know graciously conceded and said okay let's give it a go and uh, not of course none of us had any idea what it would actually entail and so initially these 26 you know these guidelines were issued so we thought chalo we'll just you know look at these guidelines and we'll continue to print so we continued as if there was nothing you know we said we're not doing anything you know that is dangerous or anti national and so on and then we got the first notice so the first notice was because on the 2nd of october as they had always done uh, rajmohan and his brother ramchandra gandhi and acharya kripalani and various others went here to rajghat to you know pay their respects to at gandhi ji's samadhi and they were detained because apparently there was section 144 you couldn't have an assembly of so many people and they were all picked up and taken away and then subsequently they were released so when we got the news we said chalo i mean our chief editor has been arrested also detained so we must write about it so we did a item on it and published it in that weeks and we got a notice from the uh, censor saying you have violated the guidelines and just around then minu had uh, filed the case in that freedom first thing so you know we thought let's see how much we can push it so we just actually ignored that didn't do and just went ahead without going in for censorship but finally what happened was they got to our printer so we used to print at a big uh, printing house called janmabhoomi which was a gujarati newspaper which used its excess capacity for printing other things including epw and himmat and janmo bhumi got a notice saying you're printing this journal which doesn't submit to censorship and this might create problems for you in informally it was told so the janmo bhumi owner spoke to rajmohan and said please find yourself another press and after that it became impossible for us actually because no press would print himmat with their print line uh, because they would be in trouble you know and there was obviously an investment involved and so at that point we had to start going to the censor and the censor that time initially was a man called vinod rao who used to be editor of indian express in fact i had known him as that and uh, because i used to go and borrow photographs for him mat we used to beg like all small publications and um, so vinod rao was like one super editor you know he had a blue pencil i would go with our this was the typewriter age by the way all the young people don't even know what a typewriter is and where as i was telling neha that you know it's i find it so amusing today that there are fact checkers and sites that are fact checkers this was like dinned into our heads when we were journalists and especially because you were working with a typewriter you were told that you know if you've got even a date wrong or something wrong you'll have to type the entire thing again so before you hit the keyboard think check and then only type okay that's a site thing anyway mr rao would arbitrarily look at something saying this can't go and put his blue pencil and i would argue with him and he would say kalpana these are directions from delhi i said how can they be directions for delhi if something i have just submitted to you he said no <laughs> this cannot go so you know in a small weekly magazine where you have tight deadlines there would be articles that would just be dropped and there was no arguing and when i used to step outside his office there was, there was a um, mantralay functionary called abhyankar i remember and he stood tell me in marathi he said don't argue with him it's very dangerous these days you know because i was very young and he thought he should warn me that it's you know these are not the type of things you can do which you can do in a newspaper office but it was the tedium of just going and sitting there and talking to somebody who was not listening and who would not explain and you we had no option we had to sometimes keep literally like another issue of himmat ready 
even then we took our chances. We only submitted certain things. We refused to submit the whole journal and knew that at some point we'd trip up. And then we finally had to raise money through our readers to buy a small uh, you know, rent gala, which is like a space where you have a printing machine. And there was one printing machine, a treadle. Again, this is like some other damana, which I will not try and explain to you, but it prints like four pages at a time, you know, slowly, slowly, slowly. And it didn't have any typesetting, so we had to get typeset somewhere else and bring the galleys and, and make up the pages. But we could at least have our own print line. So we could persuade a printer saying, you print the bulk of it, but the print line is ours. So that way we managed to somehow survive the rest of the emergency by sometimes giving in, sometimes not, and waiting for this Minu Masani's judgment. When it came in 76, that's when we felt justified that we're not going to show our copy. Let's see what they do. Fortunately for us, you know, uh, the elections were announced. Otherwise, we would have still been in trouble, I'm sure. I have a quick question where yeah. you write in that piece also that one of the most important guidelines was where news is plainly dangerous, the paper will assist chief press advisor by suppressing it themselves. Yeah. So what, what, can you tell me three things that qualify as dangerous according well, to this guideline? Yeah, well, I mean, Mr. Rao, of course, is, uh, uh, God rest his soul, he's not around to explain this. Frankly, I didn't know. I mean, how could a report about people going to Rajghat be dangerous, okay? And, uh, you know, the other thing may I say that, you know, there were a lot of things that were never reported. You know, we were too small a magazine to have reporters sent to Delhi to cover, you know, the demolitions. Uh, even in Bombay, demolitions took place in, in Chambur, in Cheetah Camp, but we couldn't write about it because we had nobody who could physically go there. We were like three people doing everything from layouts to clearing the forms, to going printer, writing, et cetera, editing. Uh, and the big newspapers were not touching it. So they were, I mean, that news was obviously dangerous because it would show the arbit what was happening in the state. You couldn't, uh, you couldn't uh, um, uh, even arrest that took place in Bombay, for instance, you know, where young people also courted arrest, could not be reported. And uh, so, you know, they were, it was very clear things like arrests, demolitions, any protest. None of it could go in. So, I mean, the thing is, you just decided that if these things cannot go in, let's keep away from it. Let's find other things that can go in and figure out a way to write, you know. So, through our editorials, through Rajmohan's column, we were still trying to convey something. And I think readers were getting it because, you know, the fact is the journal survived and, and flourished a little while till the market cancelled it out. But, uh, yeah. I mean, this uh, sort of... What qualifies as dangerous also reminds one of the recent cases where journalists have been uh, penalized for, for the work they do. The most important example is that of Pavan Jaiswal from Mirzapur, who did a story on how in the midday meals, uh, uh, students are being served roti and salt, and he was charged with criminal conspiracy. He passed away last year because he did not have funds dealing with the case. And similarly, during COVID also, we saw a lot of journalists, like in the first three, four months of 2020, we saw some 55 cases filed against journalists for reporting on the lack of PPE kits or, uh, you know, uh, Epidemics Disease Act imposed against them. So there is a sort of parallel in, you know, this sort of vagueness around what is dangerous and what is not allowed. But Chandar, in the morning we were talking about the emergency days and you brought uh, a very important point where you said that in those days you said that there was this sullenness in the media where they would publish the government's version but not really be cheerleaders the way they are today. Would you like to elaborate on that? Yeah, so, um, see, uh, there, there were two, two things which, which uh, the Ministry of INB under uh, um, Shukla, right? Vidya Charan Shukla. Uh, two things which they did. One was that they made, uh, they made a matrix of all papers. They, 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 they sat down a, a huge committee to analyze six months prior to the emergency, because during the emergency, nobody was able to publish anything. So they did a study of all newspapers over the six months prior to emergency, and they made a matrix of hostile, friendly, and neutral. And then within that, there were three settings for each, which would be plus, minus, and, and uh, you know, whatever. So they actually put newspapers into these slots, and the slots were then used in two ways. One was 
for government advertising. If you were friendly and friendly plus plus or whatever, then you would get a lot of government advertising and it would be a dim diminishing scale. And if you were hostile, you would get none. And if you were neutral, but you were showing improvement on that three uh, matrix thing, then you might get a little bit because there was a carrot and stick thing. Because if you're showing improvement, then you'll be given something. So the cheerleading were, and the other, the other uh, thing, this was the first, the other thing was that they were putting out a huge amount of their own statements, you know, the 20 point program, the so and so, the, um, um, the, the thing for, for uh, uh, sterilization, we have achieved this, we have achieved that, trains are running on time. So what, uh, what I was uh, speaking about, you know, with Neha, uh, I said the, that a lot of the media expressed their, the, the proprietors said, look, you have to toe the line. But the editors and the reporters under them towed the line by expressing it in a sullen way. There was sullenness, which was that you, you could come across four or five newspapers in a, in a given city, all of which had almost the same front page on a given day, because it would have the government handouts would just be printed verbatim, top, 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 top. So you would, you would find the same thing. So it was a dead giveaway to any reader. Everybody knew these are just press handouts. There's nothing added or subtracted from it, not a word. So um, as opposed to that sort of, uh, uh, that sullenness to, today, and th there was a certain amount of cheerleading also, but the cheerleading was basically that here is a government which is trying to work, or this, uh, uh, they, are, they are now suddenly, you know, discipline has improved, attendance in government offices is, uh, people attend on time now, which they never did, you know, that kind of thing. But today what has happened is that the, the media, particularly the television media, but also, um, um, uh, you know, many other forms of media, have become the cheerleaders for the government in a very virulent and very uh, dangerous way, which is that they are, they are becoming the, the sort of the vanguard, the front of hate mongering, of, uh, of uh, whipping up passions um, to divert attention from issues. You know, I mean, say, say like uh, the um, Rhea Chakravarti uh, Sushant Singh case is not hate mongering per se, but uh, it was whipping up passions in an in an um, in a very very dangerous manner, very shocking manner, playing with people's lives in in uh, uh, you know um, destroying people's lives with no compunctions at all because you wanted to uh, distract people's attention at a given time from something. So uh, I don't know how true it is, but apparently every morning a, a tweet would go out from a particular uh, location, and then everybody in the media was expected to make that the mainstay of their. Uh, evening uh, prime time programming and so on. So um, that is one. The other thing is like say, say the Tablighi Jamaat uh, being blamed for the, uh, for the pandemic. Um, you know, th uh, all, there are all kinds of issues and the issues are, they come up with sort of relentless regularity. It's that one issue uh, dies in one state and then another issue is suddenly raked up in another state. So there's never a time when, uh, when there is no distraction available. There's always a distraction available to take you away from the things that matter. And it is all being driven by the largest of the media houses, the largest and the most prominent and the people with the maximum reach. So, so this is something which I think is very different from the 1975 uh, emergency, is that now uh, uh, there is a, with, a, with a sort of, uh, you know, uh, with an utter and complete besharmi, there is, um, the government's will is being done by the largest of media houses with no compunctions, with no uh, you know misgivings, and with no pushback from the editors and so on. So, so you know that that's what I meant by the sullenness versus uh, ra 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 um, attitude today. I mean, that, that it's also important because then coming back to public interest journalism, we do know that a lot of newsrooms now in the morning meeting, I don't know if you're familiar, in the morning meeting, instead of talking about story ideas that need to be done, you're supposed to check what is trending on Twitter and come up with story ideas around it. And so that in itself is actually uh, not, ha does not have public interest in mind, but actually catering to the market and what is going to get clicks or what is going to get TRPs, apart from also having IT cells who are paid to trend certain things and then report around it. But then uh, bringing it back to the vagueness, Kalpana, uh, 
earlier like you would say that there will be punitive actions against news organizations or journalists because they had reported something or because they did not follow the guideline but now as uh, the Indian uh, news organizations are also heavily dependent on gig economy. So which means that a lot of freelancers are actually bringing in news stories from the ground. Lots of news organizations have shut down bureau as a cost cutting measure. The revenue models have changed. So in that situation, we see that a lot of cases filed against journalists for reporting what they're reporting from the ground are not quote unquote press related cases but actually law and order related cases. So for example, in Pawan Jaiswal's case that I mentioned, because Pawan Jaiswal was a freelancer for a number of news organizations, and because you're paid like a pittance for the stories that you submit, you have to have something on the side. So he ran a grocery shop. And so when the cases, when the law and order related case was filed against him, uh, the news organizations that he wrote for, they withdrew, they distanced themselves, and they said that, oh, there is something personal going on because he ha runs this grocery shop, so there's some personal interest. But this is a pattern that we've seen repeatedly used against journalists. So how do you interpret this different from the 70s and now? Like, wh what is your assessment of the situation? Well, if you're talking specifically about the emergency period, then you know, the orders were more or less against publications and not against the individual journalists. There were individual journalists and editors, as you know, who were picked up and arrested, you know, uh, like Kuldeep Nair and others. Um, and so therefore, I think that is a very big difference. I think the other thing, uh, just to take off from uh, what Chandar was saying, that uh, then to the big media fell in line, yeah? Because, uh, you know, even though they were not market pressures, there were these indirect pressures from the government in any case. I mean, there's never been a completely free uh, private media in India. Because apart from newsprint, uh, many of these uh, were industrialists who had other industries. And there was always pressure put on them if they did not conform, if they went beyond a certain line. That line was very nebulous. But I think the, the, the difference was then there were these small publications like Freedom Post. You know, there was a man called A.D. Gorwala. Uh, who ran something called Opinion. If any of you are interested, you should try and see. I don't know whether any copies exist still of Opinion, but he was a former bureaucrat who really had the inside track of what was going on. And he just published it himself. It was an eight-page little pamphlet that came out regularly. And that was very critical of Indira Gandhi and the government. And of course, he had to close it down during the emergency. So, you know, there were things like that which were published. That So to me, the importance of those, the fact that the government was bothered about these himmat with, you know, it's 24 pages, uh, Freedom First, which was Mino Masani's, Chuni Bai Vaidya's, Bhumi Putra, Janta, which was brought out by the socialists. That parallel is still here because it's the small independent uh, spaces that the government is worried about, you know. Big ones anyway, they've kabzoed. So in a sense, it was similar. You know, They were not so bothered about those big places because they knew they had various ways in which to keep them in line. It was very difficult to control the smaller ones. But to come to your question, I think you know, we were all part of organizations, especially the smaller publications, that had taken a stand together. So there was no question of an individual, first of all. We were part of Himmat. You know, I didn't have a profile as Kalpana Sharma. This is very, very pre-Twitter. And um, and I think that kind of solidarity, um, I think, continues still with, again, the independent uh, spaces that are there now. Uh, but uh, I would say that the, in the big mainstream media, uh, first of all, journalists have been allowed to build a profile, which I'll tell you, I worked for mainstream after Himmat closed till I retired. And um, in one of the major publications that I worked with, we didn't get a byline till what was it, in the 1990s, you know. Whatever I wrote, it may have been a fantastic story, but if I go back and look at that newspaper, I know I wrote it, nobody else does, because my byline would be a special correspondent, you know, so. So we were not building up our profiles. With the change in, in the media and the corporatization of the media, this whole thing of the profile of journalists has also come in as part of the marketing of the media. So you get mug shots. At one point, in fact, that's gone now. But there was a time, I don't know if you remember Chandar, suddenly newspapers, even reporters, their mugshot would appear next to the byline. So you, you had a face and a name together, you know, and we were, I mean, we grew up as faceless journalists, you know. 
I remember going to a meeting once and said, uh, I introduced myself and I said, I'm Kalpala Sharma. This is on nuclear energy, which is one of the subjects I have to write about. An elderly gentleman sitting next to me from Nias in Bangalore. He looks at me and says, no. I said, what do you mean, no? <laughs> he said, you cannot be Kalpala Sharma. I said, why? He said, because that is a much older person who's written that article. <laughs> I'm just giving you this other side because, you know, nobody knew what my age was, what I looked like, but I wrote. So I think that has changed also. You know, I think journalists have become personas. And I think, I'm not saying it's right that they're targeted, but I think it's all part of this commercializing of the media, where even the persona of the journalist has been commercialized. And I think as a result, what you write, but also who you are is out there. And, but it's, uh, this is for metro-based journalists. It's very different for the people who work uh, in our smaller cities. And uh, Shevanti Nainan, as you know, has written a very good book called Headlines from the Heartland, which is really worth rereading because it's what a struggle it is for the so-called stringers who actually feed in the most important news to all the big media organizations who are not recognized, who are not protected, and who undergo the worst kind of harassment. And we saw that recently uh, in uh, Bihar, was it, in the cheating case, yes. where those three guys were in jail for one month. For, for what? For having exposed the cheating, you know? Yeah. But, uh, that, that one of the biggest examples of that is that during the pandemic also, particularly, particularly the first wave, we did see a lot of uh, workers walking back home. But we don't know what happened to them once they reached because most of the uh, journalists from uh, rural areas or smaller towns did not have access to taxis or passes and all of that. And so uh, that, that's a huge uh, caveat. Also, like you said, like Sainath said that if you have only 800 words to write about something, don't make it about yourself. Yeah. And so which is why lots of, lots of articles now start with, I took an auto and yeah. it was hot and then I yeah. got out and then I <laughs> saw a samosa at a tea stall and the samosa reminded me of my nani's uh, house and the origin of samosa is in Africa. It was called sambusa and that's how it starts. You wanted words <laughs> yes. <of God. laughs> So uh, coming back to uh, the legal aspects of it, protecting all, all these journalists, for example, let's say a lot of uh, journalists I do know during the first wave, they did not have passes, right? Or they, most of the uh, journalists don't even have uh, a press card. So then in that situation uh, and the law and order related cases that are filed against journalists, what role can the court play in the current situation? Because you, you talked about the cases that were filed during the emergency and it did sort of help. But do you think right now there is a possibility where the courts can intervene or something can be done about that? So I'm, uh, I think it's, it's very unfortunate uh, that one has to acknowledge this, but uh, let, let's just look at it uh, sort of structurally. The way things have worked in the, in the present, uh, you know, from 2014 till now, and especially uh, it's ratcheted up towards the end of the first uh, first term and and post 2019 it's got you know ratcheted up many many notches again the pressure so there's uh, there's a twofold thing and the problem here is uh, of of any legal intervention is the 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 way i see it is one is uh, the pressure on proprietors who as kalpana said are all uh, most of our media proprietors have multi industry um, exposures. In fact, uh, the media very often is, a, um, a, in terms of finances, is a very small part of their empire, but it's, a very, it's very important to them personally to have that, um, that foothold in the media and so on. So, um, uh, so what, what the pressure on the propri proprietors have, has done, for instance, is that, um, just, just to name a few, Barkhadat uh, was made to resign, was uh, made to resign. Now, this was, though she was in NDTV, but it was, because um, the, the, the parties in power, et cetera, et cetera, say that no spokesman will come on your, on your show, nobody will come, blah, 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 et cetera. So there'll be a complete boycott of your entire channel by the government in power, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So Jan 2017, she resigns. Bobby Ghosh uh, is made to resign as the he editor of Hindustan Times. Um, uh, and and I, if I rec recall right, it was uh, the, all the... Uh, proprietors had been called for a meeting with the prime minister, and there was a meeting at which uh, uh, you know Shobhna Bhatia had met uh, Modi, and 
and two days later or something, Bobby Ghosh is made to resign from HT. Harish Khare was forced to step down as editor of the Tribune in March 2018. Tribune had just exposed the complete the 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 complete lie that Aadhaar is is a foolproof, safe, and uh, you know sort of a, um, um, a glass walled entity which nobody can get into and all. Because in Jalandhar they exposed the lakhs and lakhs and lakhs of Aadhaar, uh, uh, you know the entire data uh, leak and all. And he's made to step down. And he was made to step down three months before his contract was getting over anyway. So they could have. They could have just let him work out the rest of his uh, his three year contract, but they had to make a statement. They had to they had to show their power. Um, ABP managing director Milan Kandekar, followed by uh, ABP Television, uh, Punya Prasun Joshi, uh, who had this show called Master Stroke, or both in in the course of the same month in in 2018, I think it was in August or something. They both made to resign. Abhisar Sharma. Uh, a month later, in, in the same AB, ABP News was made to resign. Faye D'Souza resigned from Mumbai Mira. Sham Mira Singh uh, was uh, removed from Aaj Tak. And this is just, but this is people who are prominent. These are the names, like Kalpana says, the ones who have, have a presence and who have now become prominent in their own right. But at the lower level, what happens is, now these are resignations. At the lower level, what happens is that you have a large number of reporters, etc. Now I'm talking about the organized reporters, not the stringers. But these are young people who have obviously got a job, so they must have taken housing loans, they must be you know, paying installments on their car, they must be doing this, doing that, putting their children through school. They are completely vulnerable. They cannot uh, uh, deviate from the party line. They cannot deviate from whatever the proprietor wants because they are, uh, you know, they are all at the sort of, uh, you know, um, the start of their careers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And they and and one, it would be unreal to expect them to stick their necks out. Then you have the vast majority of news, uh, which, as Nia said, now is no longer by paid journalists at all. This is the vast majority of news gathering today, apart from this. Uh, crap which masquerades as news on uh, on prime time, which is not news at all, which is just shouting uh, matches. But uh, what, where actual news gathering happens, it happens only through stringers. And the stringers are all over the country in small places. They are not on anybody's roles. So they are completely dependent on an entity which will, um, which will take the news that they offer and pay them for it. Right, so uh, the, so the, these are people with no um, uh, with no cushion or safety net or anything. Not even a not even a structure, not even a job, and that is the vast bulk of of news gathering which is happening in India today. So to have legal intervention for them, except for legal intervention, could only happen if the organization were to say that I am being muzzled. And this is a violation of Article 191A or whatever, you know, the Minu Masani kind of thing. If, a, if, if organizations were to take it up, but the organizations are compromised uh, or terrorized or whatever, and they don't uh, or, or can't or won't take it up. So that, what does that leave then? That only leaves the, um, the internet-based organizations, the non-advertisement uh, model organizations, you know, news, news laundry, the wire, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, Quint or whatever. Um, so, so those are the only ones, and those are the ones who are now uh, being, going to be target, are being targeted and going to be targeted um, with these income tax rates and so on and so forth. So I, uh, it's sad to say this, but I think uh, legal intervention is going to be very ineffective. So uh, I'm just uh, taking off from what you said, also the fact that apart from a lot of independent news organizations uh, facing a resource crunch and still trying to stand up, the other problem also is the uh, lack of access. So the fact that you are identified from certain news organizations and which is why you will not be able to cover a ministry or a department in a certain way, the way the mainstream organizations who are towing the line are doing that. But also there is one more thing that Kalpana you mentioned in your piece, but also we have been talking about it, is that in the corporate media model, if you as a journalist cover anything around public interest, you are immediately identified as activist journalists, right? And so then Kalpana, it's very, and then the moment you're identified as an activist journalist, uh, 
you are sort of dismissed and any stories that you do are seen as something from the margin and doesn't really need to be talked about. So Kalpana, what do you think, how, how can we break this? Particularly in the times we're living in also because a lot of investigations and stories that need to be told are coming from independent organizations or journalists who believe in public interest journalism. Okay, so that's a chapa on my forehead which has lived forever. <laughs> And I used to always say, uh -huh, you mean active journalists, no? Because the others just move from the office in Bombay, from office to Mantralay, which would be like, in the office that I worked the longest was just a few steps. <laughs> and that was the end of the day's work. Yeah, no, see, I think one thing we must remember, we've talked about the emergency, but you know, actually for the Indian media, I think the most important period was immediately after the emergency. And that's really not been written about or studied enough because once Mrs. Gandhi lost the elections in 1977, till about, say, I would say mid-80s or late 80s, the Indian press really came alive, including mainstream media, because this whole thing of you know being deprived of something we were so taken for granted uh, made everybody wake up, even the most complacent. And that is when you got the most important stories that came out done by journalists. Not only did they write those stories, but they followed them up with public interest litigation, bonded labor, uh, the Bhagalpur blinding, so many of these stories, the Kamla case, so many of these stories came out of that feeling that these things have to be written about. Also, it was in that period that the stories of the mass sterilization, uh, you know, the demolitions, which were suppressed during the emergency came out, and the journalists who did that realized that this was just the top of the, you know, it was just something that had to be unearthed much more. And therefore, we found actually, as part of routine reporting, much more of this kind of what we call public interest uh, journalism. But actually, it's just journalism, you know, uh, which needed to be done, including in cities and beyond. Um, and to me, the singular lesson of the emergency, which I keep saying is, as far as the middle class was concerned, everything was fine. Trains were running on time. The cities were clean. People were coming to offices. The people who suffered the most were, as always, the poorest because their stories we did not tell. And their stories were the ones that finally got Mrs. Gandhi voted out because of the extent of anger that people, poor people were feeling during the emergency. Because whatever we may think freedom of the press is some luxury, but if that information of a violation gets out, at least there's a little bit of a chance that some pressure will be put in some thing will be done even though you know the whole system is rotten in many ways but if that is not there then there's absolutely no hope you invisibilize them to the extent that they disappear and i think that the 80s made all of us as journalists feel we must not allow this to happen you know we must make sure in all our publications so whether it was expressed in times of india there was series done on so many of these issues you know journalists were sent out they were backed by their media organizations to actually go out and write those stories. Um, there were other instances where journalists themselves, uh, you were saying that you know now in news conferences they talk about uh, morning conferences where they talk about what's trending on Twitter. But I know of instances on environmental journalism which really came alive after 1984 on the Bhopal tragedy. I know journalists working with big organizations like Times of India who wanted to do a story on, uh, say, industrial pollution, you know, which was affecting uh, rural areas. The newspaper was not interested. Journalists themselves went, did the story, and fought to get it published. And it got published. So those were spaces that were there because of the shock we got during the emergency. Unfortunately, when I say till the late 80s, that is when the economy started opening up. That is when liberalization came in. That's where corporatization of the media came in, started very much by one big newspaper house, but then followed by all the others. So the concept of news changed from what sells rather than reporting what is actually going on. So one last question before we open it uh, to the house is, uh, Chandra, you, in the morning you also spoke about uh, like there were laws during the emergency uh, according to which detentions were made, uh, people were arrested. 
but this is a time where we talk about sadiq kapan sadiq kapan was arrested even before he reported a story and he was in jail for 2 years and that is something that actually must be talked about that the fact that you have not even done a report and you do get arrested so in such a situation what is it that we need to work towards as as people who are interested in freedom of expression as people who are interested in a free press what is it that we need to do that we need to think about seriously to make sure that there is some sort of freedom of speech and expression guaranteed for us in the current times so uh, let me just preface it by by saying that uh, um what, what one one slight difference between uh, the emergency period and today uh, is that uh, most of the uh, arrests and detentions then were uh preventive detentions or detentions under the misa the maintenance of internal security act so they were the detainees whether it was kuldeep nayar or lk advani or xyz whether it was a, um, a social activist or a, a journalist or journalist i i must say there were there were very few uh, who were actually detained but politicians trade union leaders in very large numbers and so on uh, but they were all treated as political prisoners um and uh, and their experience in, in jail in fact uh, you know some of them commented on the fact that like in bombay all of them were kept together in arthur road jail in, in in a particular section of the jail so they were actually allowed to completely intermingle and they 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 could sort of uh, generate a narrative from inside the jail despite the muzzling of the media and all that but but uh, everything always gets out right so they were they were also controlling the narrative to some extent from delhi from here from there etc etc today what has happened is that there is a weaponization of criminal laws and of central agencies so what is happening now is that if a if a, a munawar a munawar farooqi right the stand up comedian if he before he's even uh, um, uh, you know done his act he is uh, arrested on the basis of what he is likely to say and uh, and what is it under 153a promoting enmity between uh, uh, communities or or whatever um one month one and a half months uh, a person spends in jail uh sidi kapan for instance before he is even reached hatras uh, is arrested and then they throw the book at him with uh, you know uh, uapa and uh, and now now he's got another pmla case against him and so on uh, these are these are laws which uh which are draconian because they don't allow bail i mean the 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 uh, the scope for bail is so narrow and so tight and now of course made much worse by this brilliant judgment of the supreme court of india in uh, in chaudhry's case so what do we do how do we deal with this because there's a weaponization across the country like like during the pandemic uh there were hundreds of journalists all over the uh, country who were either they were terrorized into not reporting or when they reported they would have cases against them they may or may not have been arrested but there were cases registered against them you know newspapers very gleefully use this word booked so and so has been booked in this and so and so has been booked in that uh that doesn't mean they've been arrested but that means that that an fir has been lodged against them and they are now facing the threat of of uh, you know further action under under these laws um how do we deal with this uh, uh, this thing when when the states are complicit and and even where the top person may or may not be complicit but the top person is going to be sort of whistling and saying don't look at me i didn't do it but not doing anything not saying anything not going to not going to check what is happening whether it's the top person in the state or the top person at the center or whatever so i i really there's no easy answer but i do think that we have to have a much more vibrant network of lawyers and uh, activists who who have to be networked together all across the country to uh, give very quick um, succor and and support in all such cases because there has to be a pushback if if somebody has been booked for something which is plainly and and transparently not a crime right uh, if munawar farooqi like like it shocks me the fact that when i read that that he could be kept behind bars for a month or month and a half for a show that he didn't do um which civil i mean we are a civilized country we claim to be a civilized country with a civilization of 5000 years this is a this is worse than than the most uh, you know uh, the most primitive and i mean primitive nations are far more civilized than this um uh, this is un, unimaginable how can anybody how can any court have remanded him at all 
and should that judge not hang his or her head in shame for doing that and should instead of uh, celebrating the fact that those, that Sadiq Kapan has got jail, uh, bail after two years, should we not be lamenting it that how could you keep him behind bars for two years? This man who was just on his way somewhere, why did everybody not step up earlier? You know, so so we uh, we have we have these problems. You know, even in the media, we we have the a media which, um, for instance, let, let's say. Uh, you know, everything is not new. You have the emergency, you have different regimes, you, have, you know, every regime has misused laws and all that. But uh, what is happening now also happened between 1999 and 2004. We tend to forget. We tend to forget what happened with Tehelka when Tehelka did that, did that sting uh, on Venkaya Naidu, was it? Bangaru Lakshman, I'm so sorry. I, I uh, apologize to Mr. Naidu. <laughs> but but, but uh, uh, after that sting, um, Shankar Sharma and Devina uh, Mera of, uh, of First Global, which was only the 15% or 20% angel investor in Tehelka, they had 265 uh, show cause notices against them under every law in question. And Shankar Sharma spent months in jail, um, you know, with, uh, with uh, arrest and the multifarious thing. And his, uh, their only crime was that they were angel investors in Tehelka, which had exposed the government's uh, sort of Achilles heel. Right. So uh, what, what did the media do when this happened? The media was utterly and completely silent. Nobody rallied behind them. Nobody rallied behind Telka. Everybody was very happy. Everybody was very happy. Mainstream media was very happy that these upstarts have been shown their place. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, it's, it's a fact. There's, there's a lot of jealousy in the media. Somebody is doing well. Somebody is now, now, now if, if internet uh, um, um, houses have started rising up, the mainstream media must be feeling threatened by that. And tomorrow, if, uh, if uh, some internet house is, uh, is uh, you know, booked, so to speak, I can just see these people gleefully accepting it. So we need to set up, a, we need to network, we need to get together, and we need to have a pushback. Mm -hmm. And we need to have an instant pushback whenever these things happen. Thank you for that. We have completely run out of time, but we have time for two questions. So comments can come later during the lunch break, but questions, if you have any questions, you can free to ask. Yeah, uh, so are there any specific laws in place that you could like uh, point to from a regulation or a compliance framework that either need to be repealed, altered, or just used less or more for the freedom of a journalist? Yeah, so you, you spoke about that how during the emergency the people who were most affected were the poor, and eventually they were the ones who voted Mrs. Gandhi out of power. But I think that's where the parallel stops today. And whether we like it or not, uh, the government has been winning elections. And also, we have to accept the fact that the, especially the bottom of the pyramid has benefited to some extent, and which is why we are seeing. So, so it's it, it's it's a little bit disorienting for me. So again, is it not that now we had a lot of the issues that we are talking? Of course, they do affect a lot of us, but in some ways, we it's probably affects the intelligentsia, the intellectual class, so to say, or the Khan market gang, as the media likes to call it. So, how do we get out of this conundrum then? So, there are um, um, there are no laws uh, really which which uh, specifically protect uh, the media or something, but the uh, but the the constitutional framework. Uh, uh, it is now, uh, you know, part of the uh, basic structure. The, the Supreme Court has evolved the basic, basic, basic structure doctrine, which says that the basic structure of the Constitution can't be violated or altered at all. Freedom of the press and, and freedom of expression under 191A is part of the basic structure of the Constitution. And the, the limitations on it are very, very narrow and very limited under 192. So it's only for security of the state, et cetera, et cetera. There are only certain narrow exceptions. Uh, otherwise, we have we don't have freedom like uh, like uh, in the United States of America, where you can say anything, however offensive, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But we have a great deal of freedom on paper. The thing is to see that this is pushed and see that uh, see that it do, it's not allowed to go onto the back burner. What ha is happening today, or what has been happening over the last seven or eight years, is cases are filed and the the big cases are just relegated to. Um, to the back burner, and they don't they don't see the light of day. They don't get heard. That's why I said there has to be an instant pushback when the thing is fresh. When when somebody has been arrested, we have to there and then push back. And and there has to be a pressure on that judge sitting in Jumri Talaya or wherever that 
that they, that that judge is being watched that there are people who are speaking up that there are so that that uh, you know everybody then pulls up their socks and functions better they'll still do what they do maybe but they will not perhaps be as brazen and and you'll be move you'll be able to move faster when you move to the next rung of the ladder and so on and so forth it should not take the kind of time it took uh, with with uh, siddiqui kapoor for instance Okay, so I had coffee at Khan Market this morning, so I presume I'm part of the Khan Market gang, even though I don't live in Delhi. No, but seriously, my point about uh, the fact that the media was forced to suppress uh, what was happening to poor people during the emergency and that that anger led to Mrs. Gandhi's defeat does not is not in correlation to the fact that if the media had written, would Mrs. Gandhi have been defeated or not? They're two completely different things. and today the fact that even today with all the so called freedom we have the media is still not reporting enough about what is going on is a completely different story because we are in a different country with different politics and a different economy and in fact as i said the news has become commodified so that it is only news that sells and poverty does not sell and that is why poverty is not written about and those journalists who are committed to writing about those things activists Uh, marginalize themselves and have a difficult time getting what they write published but my point is journalism as it ought to be for all time regardless of these changes has to be to report what is going on and if in a country like this with all this you know bombastic talk about our growing economy we've exceeded the uk etc there are still children who are dying of starvation there is still stunting to the extent that sometimes we are compared to sub sahel to africa if this is going on in this country today in this century then i think it is incumbent on the media that this forms a major part of what is being reported so that people who claim that they are the informed public are informed about what is going on in this country if you are not doing that as journalists as a media then we don't deserve to be called journalists or media that is the bottom line whether it leads to a change in politics or not that is a separate story i am talking about what the media ought to be doing what it was prevented from doing and now what it's opting not to do and the damage it does in the long run because the people who are voiceless in any case because of the economic condition we are exacerbating it by even the chance we have of making their voices heard we are making sure that those voices are never heard may I, uh, may i just add a word here um it's uh, you know whether elections are won or lost is not the the litmus test the the question is uh, what where are we as a nation and where do we want to be um you um, you know a, a news report that is about that big which pops up finally in again on one of the wires of one of the internet services which uh, which then gets known we have had in the last 2 years in 2020 21 and 21 22 we have had seven custodial deaths per day per day in this country in the last 2 years seven custodial deaths per day you don't even know about it 5400 and odd custodial deaths in the in in in, in india in 2 years who knows about it who's doing anything about it so we we've come to a situation where we are, where we are becoming inured to um uh, as kalpana said that that you know you have the the largest population of uh, stunting is that stunting carries through life because your entire life gets ruined every every element of your life of that uh, person's uh, life is 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 uh, you know is marginalized and 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 the person has to lead a sub um, um ideal existence compared to what that person should have as a matter of right as a human right a basic human right we are ignoring all this we are not we are not even looking at it because we have now come to a stage where we have gone worse it's not just silence but it's lies lies are normalized today the media can tell the 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 politicians and others can spout out lies in their speeches the media gleefully carries the lies doesn't examine them doesn't uh, reflect on them doesn't show even though Yeah, uh, you know, you 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 might have it absolutely glaringly in front of you that what has been said is a complete lie. You carry it and you endorse it. So, Now this is this is new. This is not normal. It's not normal for all your media to carry lies 
and to brazenly say say that you know i'm entitled to lie to the country so maybe so let's end this session on the note that uh, we hope we will not be informed by whatsapp where they tell us unesco has declared idli as the best breakfast uh, may the media report more about public health instead of wellness where you talk about do stories on how to lose your tummy in 10 days <laughs> and maybe get a chance to brainstorm with lawyers instead of them having to defend us all the time and represent us in the court thank you <laughs>